Exam style questions motion graphs. With this video, I'm going to go through a few examples of the kind of thing you can expect from exam questions with regard to motion graphs. What I would advise you to do, if you've watched my video on motion graphs already, and I'll put a link to it here, is to look at the question, pause the video, complete the question yourself, and then if you get stuck, you can always I'll include explanations of how I'm completing these questions. If you get stuck, you can then always unpause it, listen for a little bit, and then repause it again and have a go yourself, and then check your answer at the end. Um, okay, so question one is, toy car is a spring mechanism connected to the wheels, it's pulled backwards, the wheels rotate, compress the spring, when the car is released, the force propels the car forwards. Okay, this is the car that's pulled backwards, a straight line along a flat surface, the simplified acceleration time graph for the forward motion is shown. Okay, what do we have to do? Show that the maximum velocity of the car is about 4 meters per second. Okay, anytime you see a graph like this, it's going to either be gradient or area. So you're looking at, okay, which do I have to calculate, gradient or area? For acceleration time graphs, the gradient is going to be meters per second squared divided by seconds, which is going to give you meters per second cubed which is not, of course, the unit for velocity. If you find the area, it's going to be meters per second squared times seconds, because it's going to be the y-axis multiplied by the x-axis, and that's going to give you meters per second, which is velocity. So now we know we have to find the area under the graph. And so let's do that. And just for form's sake, we'll find the area under both parts of this graph, part A and part B. So if we look at part A, we can see that our y-axis is 3 meters per second squared, and our x-axis is 1.2 seconds. That will give us 3.6 meters per second. For b, we have on our y-axis minus 1 meters per second squared multiplied by 3 seconds, 3.6 seconds, sorry, which is going to give us Again, 3.6 meters per second. And so, that's our answer. You might think to yourself, well, that's not about 4, but actually, to 1SF, that is 4. And this is something that comes up a lot. They will give you the 1SF version. And a lot of people doubt themselves when they get something like 3.6 or even 3.52. Of course, to 1SF, that is still 4. And this is, I don't know if it's designed to make you doubt yourself, but you need to make sure that you don't. Because it doesn't guarantee that it's right, but if it rounds to that number to 1SF, then the chances are you are correct. Okay, so we've done that. Tick. On the axes below, draw the corresponding velocity time graph for the car. All right, so we need then to, to know what the velocities are for each section. And we've done this quite a bit, but let's just break it down and look at, for each section here, what the velocity time is. So between 0 and 1.2 seconds, that's while the car is accelerating. Then we have a section here where the car is not accelerating between 1.2 and 1.7 seconds. And then we have a section here between 1.7 and 5.4 where the car is decelerating. And what we need to be able to do is say what the velocity is for this bit. And we've already calculated this, so between 0 and 1.2, our velocity goes from 0 to 3.6 meters per second. When you do these questions, it's better to use your calculated value, your value to more SF. It's not, you won't be penalized if you don't, but it's best practice to use that. Um, so do try and do that as much as you can. Between 1.2 and 1.7 seconds, we have no acceleration. That does not mean that the velocity drops to zero. It just means that the velocity doesn't change for this time period. And then between 1.7 and 5.4, we go from 3.6 
down to zero. The other thing to note here, of course, is that for each of these sections where the car is accelerating, so part A and part B, we have a constant acceleration. And think about what that means in terms of a velocity time graph. That means that we're going to have a constant gradient on our velocity time graph. Okay, so we need to find these times, 1.2, 1.7, and 5.4. When you look at a time scale or any scale like this, you have to be very careful and make sure that you know exactly what the scale is. So here, we've got 4 squares, 4.5. So we need to think about where 1.2 is going to occur here, because we need to find it. So if that's 1.5, then that means half of that is going to be 1.25. And so 1.2 is going to occur somewhere in here, and we need to get to 3.6. So if that's 1.2, if we look at our y-axis scale, we've again got 4 squares for 1. Which means we need to find out exactly where 3.6 is. So that would be 3.5, so slightly above that, and we want to line that up with our 1.2. So we'll put our point there. And we do the same for our other points, point, uh, 1.7 seconds and 5.4 seconds. Once we've done that, then what we're doing, and let's put in our zero as well, is that we're just joining up our sections. We know that these are going to be straight lines because we've got a constant acceleration, zero acceleration in the second section, and then a constant deceleration. There's our velocity time graph. You might be able to do this slightly better on a pencil and a piece of graph paper. The alignment with the ruler here is it's fine, but it's not brilliant. Okay, part three. We've done part two. Part three, calculate the total distance traveled by the car. They did tell us about that it was in a straight line. So our distance traveled is going to be equal to our displacement here. And of course, with a velocity time graph, the displacement is the area under the graph. So we need to find the areas, and we're going to divide it into three sections in order to do that. A triangle section here, rectangle section in the center, and triangle section here. So our area, then, is going to be equal to a half base times height for our first triangle, plus base times height for our second triangle, and half base times height again for our third. If we put in our values, we have half of times 1.2 times 3.6 for our first triangle, giving us a total of 10.62 meters. And that is done. Example 2. Bouncing balls is a classic with regards to motion graphs. This comes up a lot, and you need to be able to interpret these. So, multiple choice question. The ball is dropped, bounces once, and is then caught. Which of the following is the correct displacement time graph for the ball? So you need to start thinking about what is going to happen to this ball. So first of all, it leaves the hand, and displacement, as we're measuring, is going to be from the hand, which means it must start at zero. So that eliminates B for us, so it cannot be B. As it falls, it's going to accelerate because it's got a weight and gravitational force is going to be accelerating it, which means that the velocity can't be constant. And on a displacement time graph, constant velocity is represented by a straight line. So we know it can't be constant, and that eliminates C. Okay, so now is it A or D? Well. We need to look at the gradients of the displacement time graph in A or D. In A, we start with the steepest gradient and it gets less, and in D, we start with the shallowest gradient and it gets more. And we know that the gradient of a velocity of a displacement time graph, sorry, the gradient of a displacement time graph represents the velocity. So is the velocity increasing, as in D, or is it decreasing, as in A? And of course, since the ball is falling under gravity, we know the velocity must be increasing, and therefore the answer is D. Example question three. The bus moves between two stops. Here's the velocity time graph of the bus. Okay, we can see just to start off that we've got some acceleration here, and it's a constant acceleration because it's a straight line. We've got some constant speed, 
and we'll just call them sections A, B, and C. And we've got some deceleration, and again, a constant deceleration because it's a straight line. What we have to do, draw a corresponding acceleration time graph for the motion of the bus show all working. So first of all, if we want an acceleration time graph, then we need to know what these accelerations are. In B, it's fairly straightforward. That's going to be an acceleration of zero between the times of 100 and 400 seconds. For A, we need to do some calculations. So we're going to do the change in Y over the change in X, which of course is plus 15 over 100, giving us an acceleration of 0 0.15 meters per second squared. And, and again, that's a constant acceleration. And part C, change in Y over change in X, minus 15 over 140, which is going to be equal to minus 0 0.107. What we now need to do is we need to transfer this data onto our acceleration time graph. Okay, so we start off at zero, and for part A, we have a constant acceleration up to 100 seconds of 0 0.15. But you'll notice that we don't have any scale in this acceleration time graph. So that's the first thing you need to do. We need to go up to a maximum of 0 0.15. So we need to divide this up. Once you've done your scale, then you're just plotting your points. And once you've plotted up your points, you simply put in your lines. And there you have it, acceleration time graph for the motion shown up here, with all of the working shown.